What's your carnal theory? Hey there, you're listening to Carnal Theory, where we talk with experts from around the world to learn how taking command of our sexual story affects our personal wellness, sexual experiences, and relationships with ourselves and others. Hello, everyone. I am Abba. And I'm Amanda. Today on Carnal Theory, we're sitting down with Dr. Kate Balistrieri, a licensed psychologist, certified sex therapist, certified sex addiction therapist, and a packed couples therapist. She's also the founder of Modern Intimacy, which focuses on mental health and relationships as well as sexuality. Kate, welcome and thank you for being here. Thanks so much for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. I'm so happy to be here. We are thrilled, Kate, absolutely thrilled. Um, today's topic and theme, um, I'll go ahead and give a disclaimer for listeners, uh, it's sex addiction. Uh, so if that's, uh, triggering for anyone, please note, uh, that that is what we will be discussing. Um, this is meant to be an educational, uh, mostly lighthearted though. We don't know yet what will come up, uh, (laughs) conversation, um, but please be mindful. If that's something that might be triggering for you, we ask that you listen to one of our other episodes. Kate, thank you for being here. Um, As our listeners know, we like to start off each show with a theory that our guest has brought for our consideration today. And as a reminder for new listeners, or as an intro for new listeners, uh, the theory, it's it's, uh, it's meant to be something that challenges a presumption or a perception that we might have in regards to our monthly theme, which as I just introduced is sex addiction. Um, we'll talk about this theory and we will loop back on this theory at the end of the show to see if maybe even during the course of this conversation, presumptions or perceptions may have shifted and we'll ask you to consider it for further reflection. So, Kate, if you would, please, could you read the theory that you've brought for us to start with today? Absolutely. And I love framing this conversation with a hypothesis or an idea in this way. It really helps to think about how we are already approaching a subject. So here we go. Compulsive sexual behavior, also called sex addiction, is subjective and it's an emotional regulation strategy that's long-term problems outweigh the short-term relief provided. As we stated at the top, this is going to be <laughs> yeah, a, a pretty complex subject. We've we've been diving into this topic all month on our social media and on and our blog. And as um, uh, as listeners may have already seen there, um, I think it serves to start the conversation with the foundational fact that there is debate around whether or not sexual addiction is real. Kate, can you get into that and and speak to why and how? Absolutely. And I'm so grateful that we're talking about this right out the gate because uh, there is no formal diagnosis right now in the DSM-5, which is the manual that mental health providers use to formally diagnose people. Um, and the, the reason for that is because there's such a, such a marked difference of opinion, even within the mental health communities. That said, internationally in the ICD-11, there are um, uh, there is a diagnosis, excuse me, for compulsive sexual behavior disorder. And that's sort of where I think the field is going. But part of why I think there's so much um, debate about whether or not, quote unquote, sex addiction is real is because there can be a lot of stigma and shaming attached to um, the addiction model, certainly, um, and people who uh, do not find solace in that label and in fact experience a lot of shaming and a lot of judgment um, when they are called an addict, even though some people find a lot of reprieve and a lot of safety in having a label for what they're experiencing. Um, but I think another reason why this debate is so hot and um, even amongst professionals who treat sexual health is because there's an absolute necessity for us to make sure that we are not shaming sexual behavior and interests and adhering to any kind of puritanical or rigid 
limiting view of sexuality that may actually misunderstand someone's sexual interests, their kink, their preferences because of a sex negative mindset and call it addiction or say that it's in any way, shape or form unhealthy or bad. So I think that this debate is a healthy one to keep having because it keeps us sharp in thinking about how are we defining compulsive sexual behaviors? What's the purpose of that? And then how do we help people make sense of it in their own lives? Are there other addictions that are as debated? Great question. I haven't seen any research, um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But I think that part of why sex addiction is also so debated is because, you know, sex can be pretty amazing. So it's hard for people to believe that somebody could be addicted and that that could be a bad thing. But it really speaks to a fundamental misunderstanding in the way in which problematic sexual behavior or compulsive sexual behavior can wreak havoc in people's lives and the ripple effect of those behaviors when they are destructive to a person's life can really create a lot of chaos and a lot of other um, dis-ease. So in terms of other addictions, I mean, there are all of the chemical addictions and then of course other process addictions, which is um, clinical speak for behavioral addictions. Um, and those include things like uh, gambling disorder or food-related um, compulsive strategies, shopping addictions, um, exercise addictions. So there are a lot of things that we do compulsively that don't carry the same stigma as sex. And I think that's because in our culture and in most cultures in the world, sex is still something that's so secret, so hush-hush, and so stigmatized, even though it's natural. <laughs> Yeah, I've been I've been grappling with that as we've been talking well, while we were doing research and as we've been talking about this month and, and and framing this conversation because it just doesn't it just feels as if there's something else playing in mm -hmm. on there even being a debate not because I personally feel like it, it has to be there has to be able to be a classification as an addiction, but the fact that there has to be this uncertainty about it, while, as you just said, things like gambling or shopping, like there's positive things that can come out mm -hmm. of that too. Like those have mm -hmm. qualities that make people feel good. But in contrast, these are carnal to the sex is carnal to us. Those are societally inflicted. Um, so it just doesn't, like to me, it just doesn't quite compute. Um, yeah. But I, I, I see. I like. I can flop that in my bread in my brain, both ways. I can see. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's carnal, then it, how can there be an addiction? Anyway, blah 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 blah. Um, can you? We could make that argument with food, by the way, right? Food is carnal. Totally. We need it to survive, and. Totally. Yeah, we don't carry um, all of the same stigmas around compulsive food related behavior. But I do think that there is a lens of um, sexism and a lens of sort of patriarchal thinking that adds extra stigma to the idea of being sexually out of control and sex being dirty or not okay. So if somebody is sexually out of control, and I'm putting that in air quotes for people who can't see me right now, um, then what does that say about a person? So when we start to uncouple um, people's worthiness from their sexual behavior, it becomes a lot easier to see sex as a vehicle for compulsive emotional regulation um, that no longer is effective, right? And I think that's a really important characteristic of, of treating this condition, whether we call it sex addiction or compulsive sexual behavior. A question that you may or may not have a, an answer to, but uh we've had a hard time finding research for this month. I'm going to try to phrase this, phrase this in a way that doesn't come out um, with, uh, with my assumption. Um, a lot of our research has led to show that male identifying people tend to be those who, if someone is coming forward saying I have a sex addiction or I am, I have a, uh, I, I have a compulsive sexual behavior, it tends to be male identifying people as, as part one of my question is that, do you agree with that? Do you find that to be true? I would say the statistics that I've seen do indicate that more uh, male identified people are the people who are getting treatment for sex addiction 
Um, whether or not that's because there's a higher prevalence in men or because there is um, more acceptability for men to get treatment around issues related to sex without it necessarily being as high of a condemnation of character as it might be for women is sort of a different question because certainly there are a lot of female identifying folks out there who and non-binary and trans folks who struggle with compulsive sexual behavior too. So it's not a gendered problem, but I do think that some of the ways that it manifests could present differently for people of different genders. And definitely there are different treatment obstacles for people of different genders. Okay. That really beautifully unpacked like part of what I wanted to get into that like <laughs> that um, male identifying uh, people that it is potentially easier to come forward with something like a sex addiction because mm -hmm. male and sex that's kosher and cool females being sexual and enjoying sex that much there is additional stigma placed upon that so right. part two of this is might there be any trails of why sex addiction has such stigma and isn't classified fully as an addiction because mostly men are identifying with it? Like, do we see, like, if, if, if it were a women's issue, yes, it would be identifiable. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'd have a thousand different diagnoses for it if it was something that <laughs> women um, carried the prevalence for because it's a lot easier for women to be diagnosed and stigmatized and shamed for all sorts of things. Um, and that's actually part of the reason why I think that this diagnosis does not exist, but but maybe not for only those reasons. Um, there are tremendous impacts to the partners of sex addicts. And if we're looking at sex addiction as something that more men are uh, being treated for and, um, and are experiencing, uh, given the statistics on uh, straight relationships that men and women tend to make up the majority of relationships still. Um, so that means female partners are the more likely partners to be indicated uh, with trauma as a result of the betrayal. So I think that there is also a camp of people who are saying sex addiction doesn't exist because that gives my male partner um, an excuse for his poor behavior and to get out of uh, accountability free card. So that debate is often made and certainly there are some folks out there who might weaponize um, a diagnosis to escape uh, culpability or accountability. But one of the things that I've noticed in all of the different treatment models for compulsive sexual behavior is the emphasis on accountability and making amends and changing behavior as a part of that amends moving forward. So I do think that there um, are people who benefit from not having a diagnosis and also people who benefit from having a diagnosis, right? We can use what's available to us to suit our motives if we're not being transparent and in our integrity. Yeah, that was that was exactly what I wanted to, to get into and ask. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that. I was wondering if we could talk a bit about kind of where you come into the picture and the work that you're doing with um, supporting people who have compulsive sexual behaviors. Um, what is like, I, I feel like in, in this sense, I guess in a lot of different like addictions and compulsive behaviors, there's kind of, it's hard to find that line where you're like, okay, it's gone too far. Um, but how can someone like, at what point do you think it's an unhealthy relationship with sex versus a healthy relationship with sex? Awesome question. Um, it's really a subjective line and it does move from, from person to person, which is why it's so important for any anyone who is struggling, if you're questioning whether or not you have a healthy relationship to sex, then that might in fact be question enough just to maybe bring in a professional and, and, and talk through those ideas and those fears with them around it to make sure that you have all the information you need to make a decision for your own life. Um, but one of the things that I help people look at is whether or not their relationship to sexuality is causing any negative consequences in their life. And they're having a difficult time course correcting in a way that eliminates those negative consequences. So mm -hmm. that could mean a lot of different things. It could mean physical injury because of compulsive solo sex. 
It could mean um, passing an STI to a partner uh, because you have been compulsively engaged in sex outside your relationship. Um, it could be getting fired from your job because you have pornography on a work computer and you get caught masturbating at work. So there are a lot of things that can happen when people exhibit out of control or compulsive sexual behavior. And it is, is different than maybe placing a moral judgment on their sexuality or their behavior, but really looking at, is this constructive or destructive in your life? And when we look at sex, I define a healthy relationship as sex as, as one that allows you to um, grow, explore, flourish, be constructive. It has a positive additive um, uh, force in your relationship to yourself and the world. And so if your relationship to sex is no longer doing that, then it might be time to kind of step back and go, what do I want my sexual life to look like? And, and how far out of alignment am I? Mm is precisely what we push at my sex bio that <laughs> yeah. commanding your sexual biography being in touch with your personal story and yeah. saying uh is am i on the trajectory of what i want just as we do with most other parts of our life from our work uh, to our family's story to all the other parts of our biography <clears throat> hairstyle etc you own it you yeah. have it be the story you want it to be Control mm -hmm. it, not the other way around. Yeah. It'll be yeah. fun. <laughs> I like this um, idea of is sex additive? Like, is it bringing more to your life? Kind of how when we say, you know, is a relationship with this person bringing you, bringing you more than it's like taking from you? And it's kind of, it, that's what it was making me think of. And similarly, we have a relationship with our, the sexual side of us, our sexual um, self and, um, I think that's really an interesting way to reflect on it. <laughs> How or, or can you give some suggestions if, if someone is finding themselves in question um, or potentially are there, are there uh, check boxes? Like if yes to these three <laughs> out of five items, you may want to go and, and, and talk with a professional yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there are actually some really great sex addiction screening tests online. Um, people in opposition of sex addiction will have critiques about the potential for sex negativity bias in those assessment tools. So I do think that's important to watch for because it definitely can be there. But I think a good rule of thumb is to think about, is there something going on in either the way you are being sexual in your thoughts or in your behavior that feels like there's a lot of preoccupation or it's difficult to stop despite negative consequences for doing so. So you've tried and you've been unable to stop and you find yourself repeating behavior that you swore you didn't want to do again. Um, are you experiencing any kind of tolerance, meaning that you are seeking out more or more extreme versions of something related to sex, again, either in thought or in behavior, um, in order to achieve the same kind of uh, release or, or orgasm or pleasure or relief? Um, and are you experiencing any kind of changes in your mood? Some people might call this a post-acute withdrawal symptom. So difficulty sleeping, higher levels of irritability, um, problems with uh, or changes in your appetite, um, you know, sadness, depression, suicidality, either uh, in the buildup or in the after effect of being sexual. So anything like that that's going on might be... Um, might be a cue to kind of check in with a professional and, and see what's going on because sometimes there's a compulsivity problem and sometimes there's another mental health condition that's underlying. And if you address that, then the compulsive sexual behavior really comes to a, a halt. Thank you for that. And, and equally important, are there, I realize the same identifiers can be applied, but um, are there potentially different identifiers and different steps to take if you are someone who feels you are in a relationship with someone mm. who may have a addiction. Yeah. Um, so that, I mean, working with betrayed partners or prospectively betrayed partners, if you're not quite sure if your partner has a sex or a porn addiction um, is, is interesting because 
there are, well, let me just back up and say this. When somebody is betrayed sexually, it often can leave a wake of symptoms in their lives that looks similar to the PTSD that someone might experience following an actual sexual assault. So I really want to emphasize the destruction that sexual betrayal can cause in a person's life. It can leave someone questioning their reality, um, questioning who they are as a person. Their sexuality might be completely upended, meaning they might become more hypersexual um, or they might become sexually averse. Um, they can engage in all kinds of uh, self-soothing strategies because it's a real trauma. And um, when the foundation of our most important relationships in life, and there are a few others that are more important than our primary partner as adults, when, when the bedrock of that gets shaken, it's really difficult to put those pieces back together. And many partners find themselves trying to pool resources toward the addicted or compulsive partner so they can get help. All the while, especially if there are children, they're sort of holding down the fort, trying to assuage their own trauma and make sense of it all. Um, and they can feel really isolated, scared and alone. So um, if anyone out there is listening, if, if you're having some suspicions, if it's starting to impact you, definitely help is out there for you. And there are many of us who are certified to work with betrayal trauma and can help and take a very active stance against victim blaming or shaming you for wanting to stay or leave. Thank you. Is modern intimacy a place where people can find those resources? And can you speak more about modern in intimacy? <laughs> I feel like I'm talking a lot. That's the idea. Yeah, we like <laughs> that. Welcome to the show. <laughs> 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 yeah, yes. And th thank you for plugging modern intimacy. Um, so in, in my practice, uh, everyone on my team can work with people who exhibit compulsive sexual behaviors, problematic sexual behaviors, or the people in their lives who are impacted by those, those behaviors. So we, you know, we, we all have a slightly different way of working with those, those concerns. But yeah, we've been helping people heal together and on their own for a long time. Uh, sorry, Eva. Um, I just was wondering, it with certain addictions or compulsive behaviors like gambling or drinking. Um, a lot of the times, people who have have become sober, so so to say, depending on what the addiction is, um, completely cut it up. Mm -hmm. I could imagine that that might not be the best option when it comes to <laughs> things like sex. And of course, like eating, you have to eat. So like you have to find that healthy right. relationship when there's, um, when there's a fraught inter relationship with food, but is it possible to have a healthy relationship moving forward with sex after um, having such a fraught one that is used as an emotional bandaid and, or I forget the word, the phrase you used um, and, Emotional, emotional regulation regulation yeah regulation yeah. yes absolutely um people can go on to have really hot thriving relationships with sex you know even after they are in recovery from sex addiction or porn addiction there's a little bit of kind of reorganizing that happens in a person's brain when they go into recovery whether it's a, a formal 12-step fellowship or therapy or some, some other kind of recovery. But when you start changing your relationship to sex, it opens up possibilities for new erotic potential. And I think that's one of the really exciting things about seeing people move from a place where sex is sort of governing their life as opposed to enriching it. Mm -hmm. And it can be a difficult shift at first because when people are utilizing sex for their emotional regulation or to get their attachment needs fulfilled in a really compulsive way, it is often really scary when that tool is no longer available to them. So there's kind of this gap between what I was doing and it was kind of working, but not so much. And in fact, now it's starting to have negative consequences in my life to, uh Oh, I don't have any tools. Mm -hmm. What do I do now to, Oh, I have new tools and wow, this feels really great. So that's a part of the process that sometimes um, can take a little while, but is very possible. And, you know, I've seen people really 
change their whole relationship to sex and they're living really integrated, thriving lives with partners either that were part of the experience or who have come into their lives after. Going back to modern intimacy for a minute, what led you to start it? I, for for listeners who may not be familiar, um, please go familiarize yourself. It is a treasure trove of resources and services and courses. Um, and Kate, you've done foundational, phenomenal work uh, setting that 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 platform up. Um, why? <laughs> well, f- first, thank you. I, I really appreciate that feedback. Um, Modern Intimacy is my second group practice. Um, so uh, I'll put that out there to sort of create a little bit of context because I've been working with the intersection of mental health and sexuality really my whole career. And I started working in the prison systems with convicted sex offenders and doing evaluations and treatment to really understand that kind of problematic sexual behavior initially. And what I learned was that so many of the people I worked with just had terrible, terrible uh, experiences with sex in their early lives. Um, And also just a dearth of appropriate sex education. And I, I think those two things coupled with you know, certainly um, different paradigms culturally that they were exposed to, you know, led them down the path of offending behaviors. So it really got me thinking about the relationship that people have with sex when they're not incarcerated for sexual offending. And of course, the, the relationships that we have with sex are very nuanced and layered and personal. So as I left that forensic context and started working in the private practice world, I wanted to more thoroughly understand all of the different ways that sexuality influenced our mental health and the quality of our relationships and vice versa. And what I learned, and I'm sure this is not a rocket science comment, but it's all connected. And, you know, each of them in our lives, if there's something um, a little wonky and wobbly in our mental health, it can influence the quality of our relationships or our sex lives. And the same is true for our sex lives and sexual function and health and pleasure and for our relationships, right? So all of these things feel incredibly intertwined. And there are, you know, some practices out there that do a really great job at it, but I feel like we can't have too many. So I opened up Modern Intimacy to um, really create a space where people from all over could get access to information that's expert driven and really thoughtful, inclusive, and with an understanding that we all have different needs and there is room for us to all get those needs met if we can create a more expansive conversation about ways to be healthy and um, integrated in those departments, relationships, sex, and mental health. You have such a badass background. And <laughs> like to with that, I... I, I I find it very personally incredibly inspiring, but also I feel like it just it it, it, it commands attention of what you are bringing to the table because of what you, from what you just said you've seen one of the paths that can happen for people who happen to get caught mm-hmm. when there is a lack of education. Mm-hmm. Yep. Do you see a, or do you have a, a a vision of what sex education could or should look like and how that could change that part of our system, of our, of our prison system? I mean, I love this question. Thank you so much for asking it, because if I were queen of the universe, um, everything that we talk about in terms of sex education would look very different. Um, and it would be a mandatory part of every child's curriculum growing up, along with um, a sensitivity training around how culture and religious values can all play a role in the way that we shape our sexual value system. But I would create a curriculum that really normalized a diversity of sexual experiences and allowed children the freedom to 
think about sex without fear, shame, stigma, or secrecy, so that their uh, natural maturation around this topic could be one that honors what is authentic for them. And, you know, some people would potentially choose the same path that their families, that their culture, that their religion outlined for them, and some wouldn't. So my hope and my goal would be that we could create a lot more tolerance around um, the way that sex can take shape in people's lives and serve different functions for them at different times in their lives. And to do so without the need to shame other people or stomp on other people's belief systems, you know, along the way, because I think that shame is the biggest culprit and creates so much dis-ease in our culture. Um, and if we could just eradicate that, I honestly think we would live in such a, such a better place. So do you potentially see a, a, a cross section of uh, tolerance and education and, um, because people are able to live their more true, honest selves, they are not acting out in what society then deems like harmful, unlaw-abiding ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when we make space for sex to be an integrated part of our experience as human beings, instead of this like dark, shadowy, compartmentalized thing that we do over here behind closed doors and shh, don't talk about and don't think about, except it's on every billboard everywhere. Um, you know, we, we've created these really um, interesting and unfortunate polarizations around sexuality that paints sex as sinful, but the goal and shameful, but something that everyone has a relationship to. So there's this inherent conversation that we're all bad somehow because we're sexual, but we're not. It's natural. No other animal in this whole species grouping of animals in the world has this relationship to sex. It's literally just human beings. So, you know, that's that's a construct, right? It's a construct thing. It's not a biology thing. And I think if we really start to change that narrative um, and stop feeling so threatened by what everyone else is doing with consent behind closed doors, that would just change, I think, the way we relate to each other so much, but also it would eliminate a lot of the need that people have to weaponize sex or to weaponize beliefs around sex. Um, and so sex has just become this, this harpoon that we throw at each other to disavow the feelings that we have inside about our own relationships to sex or power or pleasure or relationships. So, yeah, I mean, I think if we could just dismantle the whole sex education system and rebuild it from scratch, leaving out the shame piece, whew, that would be amazing. Yes, snaps to that. <laughs> <laughs> with, with the note being mindful of time, uh, do you feel that... Um, do you clearly just to, to kind of tie together conversation around sex addiction, do you feel that one equals the other? You, you, do you see the lack of sex education being a primary, um, cause of sex addiction? Or I understand that it's a complicated, um, mm -hmm. uh, it's a, yeah, yeah it's, it's a complicated, um, labyrinth the way that sex becomes the vehicle for emotional regulation or becomes the vehicle to uh to act out our unmet needs maybe is another way to think about that um could more effective sex education help disentangle some of that yes i think it could i'm not going to go so far as to say there's a causal relationship there because i i would have to do that research or see that research totally but I think one of the things that's important for people to understand is that part of the reason that compulsive sexual behavior develops is because sometimes um, it, it get, sexual stimulation is something that we learn very early on in life feels good before we have moral judgments around it, right? Children have been um, observed to play with their genitals you know, you know, from a very early age. In fact, there are even some studies that have demonstrated um, fetuses uh, engaging in genital stimulation in the womb. So 
I know. I saw that helped that head tilt. <laughs> so um, interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, guess what? Our genitals, when you stimulate them, they tend to feel good. And it's not until we layer on all this shame around it that that starts to be something that um, you know, feels not okay. So what I would what I think could happen is if we could, without shame and stigma, educate people earlier, one we would see an increase in appropriate consent and better sexual boundaries and less offending happening. Um, two, I think that we would create a context where people can talk about the exposure that they've had to sex or sexually explicit material um, earlier on. So people could, if they have had a sexual trauma or have been exposed to something that felt overwhelming, um, they could talk about it and get help earlier and reduce the likelihood that sex would become the vehicle for their emotional regulation in that way, right? In a not healthy way. Yes. Kate, this has been a incredibly insightful conversation. Thank oh, well, you thank so much. Thank um, you. Could you please, could, could we loop back to the theory that you brought for our consideration mm -hmm. and, um, and tie off with that? Would you like me to read it again? Please. <laughs> <laughs> Compulsive sexual behavior, also known as sex addiction, is subjective and is an emotional regulation strategy that's long-term problems outweigh the short-term relief provided. I have so many more questions that I want to dive into. <laughs> I wish we could have three more hours. Um, but everyone, thank you so much for tuning in today. We hope this episode has given you something further to reflect upon, and we encourage you to reach out to us with any questions or insights on our Instagram page at Carnal Theory or at MySixBio, or directly to Kate at The Modern Intimacy on Instagram. Um, definitely go check out the work she's doing. It's really incredible, and there's so much to dive into. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks everyone for listening. Carnal Theory is produced by MySixBio an educational platform empowering people like you to take command of your sexual biography. Our sound design is by David Usma and theme music by Men the Universe. Video editing is by David Usma and our assistant video editor and marketing coordinator is Maria Taruque. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, YouTube, and Spotify at MySexBio. Visit our website and join our e-letter at MySexBio.org and support our work by joining our Patreon. Thank you.